Awesome, thanks. So a lot of great stuff coming so far from Kirk and Hope as well, talking about some of the North Carolina lineup that you guys have all we'll all have access to very soon. Uh, from my end, I'm going to give you guys a really quick overview of LiDAR and feature extraction, a lot of the stuff on the Esri side of things that are out there, but also some trends and things to look forward to in the next several years, uh, disruption of markets, other things related to this too. Again, my name is Jeff Taylor. I focus under the 3D markets at Esri, uh, geodesign, 3D, LiDAR, remote, some remote sensing, and other things related to that. So what we've been doing on our end is to really try to start to integrate uh, LiDAR in all sorts of different ways into the Esri platform, as we call it. And it's not just about integrating the LiDAR. It's synthesizing that data, making meaning from it, from it uh, creating derivatives, uh, allowing you guys to leverage this for analytics to be successful. So we're going to walk through this process of beginning with what can we do with LiDAR, and then going into the process of how do you create a smart 3D city model, and then what you can do further with it. So a lot of us have seen many different flavors of LiDAR. It's like Baskin and Robbins, right? Airborne, terrestrial, mobile, UAVs. You're going to see more and more uh, of this data coming out for different usage, usages, and you guys will probably be having to work with it in some form or fashion here in the future as well. You're also witnessing what's going to happen as far as disruptive technology. NASA is going to launch ISAT next year. They're going to be able to collect 2.3 foot spacing LiDAR from a satellite. DARPA has similar things going on. So over time, you're probably going to see commercialization of satellite flown LIDAR that you guys can leverage at even higher resolutions than that 2.3 foot spacing. You're also able to get lower to the ground in more dense areas and obtain LIDAR at different directions using UAVs uh, or drones, as we call them. Uh, and these are only going to drop in price over the next several years as well. And one of the large disruptive techs that I'm really enjoying looking at and witnessing is this concept of SLAM technology, the ability to have a scanner using an algorithm that you can go inside of a building or around an environment and really quickly obtain an accurate point cloud. Uh, you may have to triangulate it to the geolocation, but this is a very fast way to go through a building in about four hours and get an entire scan, a large building, for instance. So it's not just about the outside, it's also about the inside of our vulnerable uh, facilities, uh, and other things there. So like a lot of us, we may have a lot of you sitting on our desk collecting cobwebs and, and dust, right? Uh, this has that heavy, heavy GIS data, and it's kind of difficult to really share it within our organization. I mean, right now, we've really launched the ability for anybody to use on the desktop, connect to that drive, or have that locally on your machine, and start to view those last files but it can kind of slow down our networks to an extent, too, if we do it connect that way. Um, and this is just an example of how you, fast you can actually visualize LiDAR now within ArcGIS Pro, which is really starting to enable that 3D uh, visualization and analytics on the data. So where we're going is the ability to cache these data sets at multiple levels of detail in the cloud. And what we're able to do is export uh, a version of this LiDAR in a way to where you can actually push this up to a portal environment or RGS online, for instance, and it can be streamed virtually uh, to people outside of your organization or internally on a, a local network. And everyone can access it visually that way. In the next few years, you'll be able to conduct an analysis back on this data as well. So that's kind of one way we're going. So what's driving this? LiDAR compression. It's about reducing the file size. As you're seeing, with a, a last optimized reduce the file size to about 82% on LIDAR that's classified. Um, it just depends on the, the point spacing and different attributes that exist there too as to how well it will be compressed. So that's uh, one example. And then once it's compressed, we can easily push it out and uh, we can even uh, apply RGB colors to the tops of the LIDAR. So you could actually take an ortho and drape the, the colors onto those pixels or those points and uh, visualize that in 3D in a way that you can understand a little bit better. Also, we support FODAR, right? Uh, structure from motion points that are produced that have RGB as well, as an example. So to view this LiDAR and start to work with it, really, um, you can just create a last data set, load it up in Pro, and we have this new uh, symbology panel that allow you to load it up and play around with it. So in this case, you can choose, it hey, was just view the elevation, but let's view 
let's view something more, the intensity. This is going to tell us more about uh, the different kinds of elements in the landscape. Right? It's more reflective or less reflective. Uh, let's look at classification. Right? So in the case of North Carolina, you would have something similar to this that you could start to look at in context with your GIS data even. And there's other ways that you can visualize as well. So I want to quickly go through some of the stuff that we've been releasing as far as classification capabilities. I still really like the tools that Hope's team has been using LP360 to do for some of these processes, which in some ways are a little more superior than some of these tools, but you can leverage these out of the box uh, if necessary for some processes. So we have the ability to classify ground, for instance, and then classify buildings. We can look for planes on the rooftops, and we're further working to update some of these tools as we move forward. But, uh, you know, you can choose what do you view, your last returns, view which class code. You can start working with things independently as you classify them. So to create a 3D city, the first thing you do is you classify the ground. Then you classify the buildings. If it's, this is if the LiDAR data is not classified. Then you run a tool to classify the points by height. And this is going to give you those different variations of green that you're seeing for non-building and non-ground features. And what's nice is in this tool, we've also added the ability to classify noise. And that's the thing that you usually want to get rid of as well if it exists um, in these data sets. Most of you guys may not even have to do any of this with the data that you're going to be working with. But just, just so you have an idea. Um, so that would be what it would be like to look at the individual uh, data sets after they've been classified. So, but it's not just about classifying the data with these automated algorithms. It's about being able to go and touch up some of the data. So you may find some problems over time with the LIDAR files that you have where a building was missed or something was misclassified that you feel really needs to be changed. So what you can do is you can use some manual editing tools. And you can select just the class codes that you want to update. You can go pan around to the right angle. You can select the certain points. And then you can choose what uh, class code you want to uh, change these to. So let's say I want to make it a uh, building. That was still reading that some of the points were vegetation. It changes it. So that kind of gives you an example of kind of some intuitive updating to these data sets in 3D that are fairly quick. Here's another location here. We have a small blemish on a building edge. I mean, automation is not always 100%, so this is why sometimes we'll need to touch things up and apply, right? That's kind of cool. So what we're going to talk through now is the process of going and creating some initial derivatives from this data. Like I said, you guys are already going to probably be obtaining some pre-processed derivatives, but in the case, we can just select the last return and the ground points from this LiDAR data, and we can use this to create a digital terrain model. Okay. And you can produce this at a very high resolution. And when you're trying to figure out the precise height of a building, I usually go this approach uh, so that we can actually look at a, a high accuracy pixel estimate of precisely kind of where it is. But we can also use all the LiDAR returns and do a process of creating a digital surface model. The digital surface model is the height of everything above sea level the maximum heights. And that's just one simple tool, uh, last data set to raster, that would produce both of these outputs. Okay? And then another derivative that's really valuable is what we call a normal, normalized digital surface model. And the normalized digital surface model is your actually local height of features. So when we look at a tree, we're like, oh, it's 40 feet tall, or a building is 22 feet tall, right? That's normalized DSM. Instead of saying the building is 460 feet of the roof above sea level, right? So, but there's all sorts of other derivatives that we can produce here. From contours to fill shades, going all the way down to the hydroanalysis, which is vital, to solar, and then the big thing we're going to talk about today is feature extraction, okay? Feature extraction, the ability to then, you know, create images or extract content from this data, such as buildings or trees. So, 
What we've done is released a series of workflows and tools. You can go to this URL here. You can see this link again here in a second if you miss it. It walks through the process of creating and cleaning up fairly accurate building footprints directly from classified LiDAR or even imagery. So I'm gonna walk through that process very quickly. So I can take right here and I can uh, open up a tile or several tiles for my LiDAR. And you can see we've already classified the point cloud or it's been classified by somebody else. I can then run a process called last point statistics as raster and choose a specific sampling value uh, such as let's say two feet here and get two foot pixels all the way around the buildings. That's gonna give me the elevation values of every part of the roof. So this may be valuable in some ways, but you notice there's still artifacts. There always will be some misclassification in automated processes. So what I'm gonna do is convert all those values, I can plug in many equations to do this, to one. Make it just a, a value of one and a zero where data does and doesn't exist. So then I see one value for all the building footprints, it's pixels. The next phase is to go in and go raster to polygon, convert those over. And then we've created some other tools that really help you to clean up and regularize these building footprints. And that link I showed you earlier, we'll show you again, walk through a much more in-depth process of this. But the ability to then go in and get really nice edges and get rid of those jumps in the edge of the buildings. So as we see here, zoom in a little bit. They're a little bit cleaner in some ways. So then what we can do is we can start to select anything that's less than a certain size. Typically that's gonna be an artifact. We know that a 300 square foot is gonna give us anything that's a, a, a decent size shed or larger. And we're gonna remove everything else that doesn't fall within that uh, spectrum. And then if we have holes in the middle, there's another process here used to remove holes up less than a certain area in the middle of these features. And a lot of times, you'll be missing some LiDAR points sometimes on complex structures that cause this kind of complexity. So when you're done, you end up with footprints that can produce 3D volumes of these as well. So we can also do this from imagery. And the link here, again, I'm going to show it one more time, this is actually a really good blog post on this, that you can use to take uh, your pixels and convert and extract out information. Now, with imagery, you don't get under the trees, so there's some problems and limitations there. Here's another slide. We can use segment mean shift capabilities on rasters to actually really help to clean up and produce a better outline of the pixels. Simplify that. Okay, a little more dweeby stuff. But we also can go in and we can extract out the centroids of trees fairly accurately from higher and higher resolution LiDAR. We're working hard to improve the accuracy of these tools to accomplish this, such as what you see here for this area of Beaverton, Oregon. Um, forested areas, we use the LiDAR directly, nothing else. And we use building footprints that we already know exist to make sure we don't extract trees over buildings. And using that, you can get something like you see here. So. Once we have the footprints, we can then apply what we call procedural rules. And that was from City Engine, a product we acquired a few years ago. We've integrated it into ArcGIS Pro. And we can apply that and have it recreate, using attributes, how the building should look. That's the most lightweight version of a building that can be produced other than a box. And then trees can be created as well, procedurally, based on those attributes and information. You can see different representations that can be applied very quickly. And using these three data sets, terrains, trees, and buildings, you have most of the things that are really required to really start creating a smart 3D city model. So how can you start to produce this? Well, we have a solution called the Local Government Scenes that walks you through a whole series of task operations that uh, you can start to create your smart 3D city model with, including procedural buildings, trees, um, and everything using the LiDAR data that you have available. Now, we're also working on new capabilities to release in the RGIS two, Pro 2.0 release to get more accurate buildings directly extracted from that LiDAR. 
we're trying right now to get these polygons reduced so that they're optimized to load on the web and on your machines much faster. And we'll release that more than likely at the RGS Pro 2.0 release. So that lighter you have now, you could use again later once these are out to get more accurate buildings from that. So how do these work? Well, procedural rules, if you're gonna model a couple buildings in theory, you're gonna use SketchUp or something else. But if you're gonna model an entire city and the buildings are similar, they need to be just what we call geotypical, that's where city engine uh, procedural rules come in and that's what we've built into a lot of the core of our products. Gives an example of the difference in the past, what it took to model a city, and now that you guys have LiDAR or can use that, this can be automated in less than a day to a large extent. So it's really, really awesome stuff that we can now start to do. All right? A lot of manpower. So with 3D cities, we're talking about multiple levels of detail. We've been doing level detail one, which is just an extrusion for 20 years or more. Two is what I call the procedural roofs, like we're talking about earlier. Level detail three, pictometry, other groups can do this, and we're looking to be able to do some of this coming in the future on the Esri platform. And then level detail four would involve your BIM or your CAD data. That's that highest level of detail. Well, that can be valuable for 911 and security purposes, and that data can start to be cached in the cloud or local networks so you can show people risk before it happens. So that's another thing that's going to be really emerging in the future. So what does all this look like meshed together, right? All these data layers we've talked about. Well, here's an example of the RGB colors of the LiDAR here. Kind of panning through those. So that's if you just take an ortho, using a tool we'll be releasing in the next, uh, I believe, next one or two releases of RGS Pro. And you can color it thematically. But you can also view your LiDAR this way. And that, guys, this is on RGS Online that we're sharing this out. We'll be releasing measurement tools and all sorts of other capabilities in the future as well. You can turn on your terrain and context with it. You can visualize the procedural buildings that have been extracted from this information. The trees, it's another approach. Now you have assets that you can attribute, right? So you can show vulnerability and risk, and you'll see that in a minute, or other things that are necessary from that LiDAR. Looking at an entire downtown or city area, you can look at other information, land use information, right? This means a lot to us if we're trying to see, you know, how do we improve a place? Comprehensive planning data. Point data of different kinds. I mean, this is just a quick throwing this in here. You can customize these capital improvements, right? You can put pictures in there, whatever you want to do. We can look at non-urban areas that are about to be developed or urban areas that are about to be changed. There's a lot of money coming in here, so we really need to show that. Let's look at the vulnerability of this, right? So we have our 2D floodplain data. It can be shown in the context with the 3D. And what's the critical infrastructure, such as light rails or other things that are going to be impacted too? So it's not just limited to this uh, existing conditions. It's also, you're also capable of starting to take and bring in SketchUp models, plans from developers, or you city engine, to quickly model new urban areas for certain things. And I actually had an intern that had never touched city engine, for instance, on the Esri side, model this in about 30 minutes. So it's very quick for people to quickly box model some things and export it out to the web and load it in context with your 3D city model to visualize how something could look, for instance. So you've released some other capabilities on Esri side outside of the typical point cloud area, such as drone to map, and it just allows anybody to start to be able to fly their own drone, take it up and update maybe newer areas where things have changed. So when you're collecting LiDAR, you don't always have the data for where new development's built about a year later or something else. So this is a way that you can augment, or you can have a third party come in with a drone. But uh, in this case, we can produce what's called point clouds using structure from motion and 3D models, pre-plan the flight routes, and have a derivative that's geolocated. And it, this actually has the, uh, the RGB values applied to that. It may not line up completely accurately, with your LiDAR, but it gives you a representation 
is kind of where that is. And then moving beyond that, um, the last thing I'm going to show you guys really quickly because we're close on time is the ability to load what we call integrated meshes on the web, either from drone to map. Uh, this is one example that Brycon created. You could use uh, some of the stuff that Bentley's built with Q3D and loaded on the web too. And this is great, it's a great visual, but you can't query anything. So certain processes you use for certain needs, right? So here's another example of looking at a place in Girona, Spain with um, this integrated mesh technology cached for a large area. And we can even conduct some initial analysis. We're gonna be able to have more and more processes for analysis in the future on these. But that's just a, a larger overview of well, as well of what else that we can support of 3D aside from just uh, LiDAR 2. So again, guys, uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, it's been great talking to you about this and I'd like to open up the doors for questions now. Yes? Yeah, it's all of the stuff that you guys saw is just RGS Pro. So we're everything is going to be going into RGS Pro over time. And that's where we're we're going to migrate more things to. 2D and 3D at this point are very close to being completely ubiquitous. And with LiDAR, it's going to help with that too. Yes. Yeah, so on the Esri training uh, page, we have several courses and classes on how to use it. We don't have a class on that LiDAR process that you guys saw earlier. We're working on that in the classification, but we're, we are going to have this presentation placed online. And I can send it to anybody else as well if they'd like to have access to some of those videos that we showed today. It's, it's, it's about uh, making sure your graphics drivers updated. It's one of the big things. But the other thing is that we've, it was in its infancy probably about a year ago. It's, we've really resolved a lot of those conflicts with, uh, with crashing and things. Uh, as we're having to implement a lot of 3D capabilities into it, you can expect some things to crash here and there with most softwares. So the, um, the process I showed you guys, first of all, we're extracting. It was just a very simplified version of that because we don't have time to go through all the steps in the video. Uh, but the key with that is you can run through that initial process with the link that I also posted in the presentation to get the building footprint. And then you can use that local government solutions tool that's uh, Esri's 3D C solutions. And uh, what that will allow you to do is walk you through a task-based workflow where you can take those footprints and attribute that with LiDAR data. And then you can apply those procedural rules and have a very quick representation of your city in 3D. So it gets get you to that first level of detail. Like I said, we're working on that higher level of detail as well in the moving city. So do you need to buy the No, the, uh, so that's included with RGS Pro. So if you already have the ArcGIS licensing, you can just use those task workflows. Everything I showed you guys today, if you have probably spatial analyst and 3D analyst with ArcGIS Pro, you should be able to run any of those processes. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes? Not a problem. Yeah. So, I mean, if it's in the geodatabase, uh, if you have ArcGIS 10.1 or any other previous versions, as long as you have it in the geodatabase format, shape files, whatever it is, or even if it's in multi-patch format, which we can go into more formats as we want, you can bring all of that in, and it supports those. And you can run any GP tool on those data sets too, which you typically would do with earlier releases. So, other questions? Okay, awesome. Well, thanks for coming, guys.